Happy Sabbath, family. Happy Sabbath. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to come to your sanctuary today. We're so grateful for this beautiful day. We pray that you would bless our service from this point all the way to the end. We love you and we thank you and we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about Christ's method of working and then we'll share our herb for today. For three years, the disciples had before them the wonderful example of Christ. Day by day, they walked and talked with him, hearing his words of cheer to the weary and heavy laden, and seeing the manifestations of his power in behalf of the sick and afflicted. When the time came for him to leave them, he gave them power and grace to work as he had worked, saying, freely you have received, freely give. They were to go forth into the world to share abroad the light of his gospel of the love and healing. The work he had done, they were to do too. And this is the work we also are to do in the world. In sympathy and compassion, we are to minister to those in need, seeking with unselfishness, earnestness to lighten the woes of the suffering humanity. So what Christ did... When he was here on earth, that is also our duty and our mission. In the path which the poor and the neglected, the suffering and the sorrowing must tread, the Savior walked while on this earth. We shall find in his footsteps by the sickbed, by the side of the suffering, in the hovels of poverty, stricken and distressed. So we have to follow his of footsteps where he went is where we need to go we need to seek for those who need help we may walk in these footsteps comforting the sorrow and speaking words of hope and courage to the despondent the suffering and destitute of all classes are our neighbors and when their wants are brought to our knowledge it is our duty to relieve them as far as possible a principle is brought out in the parable of the Good Samaritan that it would be well for the followers of Christ to adopt. First, meet the temporal necessities of the needy and re relieve their physical wants and sufferings. And you will then find an open avenue to the heart where you may plant the good seeds of virtue and religion. Testimony for the Church 4, 226 and 227. As we engage in this work, we are to remember that man has a body as well as a soul to save. Both are to be restored to health by God's simple but effectuous methods. In this, as in all else, Christ is our example. When people applied to him for help, he relieved the suffering body before he attempted to minister to their darkened mind. The physical sickness of the suppliant removed, his mind could better be directed into the channels of truth. So you see that Christ's method was to bring them relief and healing and comfort, and then he spread the love of God. And he himself was God, so he was sharing his love all along. Amen. Our Lord devoted more time and labor to healing the sick than preaching. When he sent forth the seventy, he commanded them to heal the sick and then to preach that the kingdom of God had come nigh unto them. The physical health was first to be cared for, that the way might be prepared for the reception of the truth which the apostles were to proclaim. And we are God's apostles for today, and we are supposed to spread the gospel. So today we're going to talk about an herb called Jamaican dogwood. Jamaican dogwood is native to southern U.S., Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. It contains isoflavones and phytosterols, tannins, which lower the uh, cholesterol, lowers blood pressure, stimulates the immune system. Um, it also 
is an antispasmodic. So if you are having spasms or any kind of uh, nerve problems, it will assist with that. It is useful, and its usefulness is undervalued. This is really, really a great herb. I learned about this herb about three years ago, and um, I used it. I, I actually use it on my son. And when I first, I studied it, and then when I made the concoction for him, I gave it to him, and I said, it was a hot tea, and I told him to drink it before he, he retired. And then I remembered that ah, it's not like regular tea, and I had to rush and get it. It is very, very, very powerful. So you have to know what amount to take. You can't just take it. So I did not leave a, um, a remedy for it outside. When we have the class, I will talk to you about it so I can tell you how to utilize it because... It is so powerful, if you take the wrong amount, it can shut down your central nervous system. But it's so beneficial. Remember, the negative reports about most herbs, like when we told you about comfrey, are maybe true in, in a little light. Sometimes they're false. But if you're educated with the right knowledge, you'll be able to utilize these things in a proper way. And God made herbs for our use. So it acts as both a sedative and a painkiller. It's used for insomnia, overexcitability, and it cons mental activity. It's also prescribed for nerve pain, toothaches, menstrual pain. Um, it's used for treating muscle spasm, especially for the back, respiratory ailments such as asthma and whooping cough. But it should not be taken by anyone who is pregnant. Now, Jamaican dogwood is very difficult to find. You can order it on, on um, Amazon. I, I like to get my herbs from places that I know I've researched that are, you know, reliable and good measure. The medicinal uses and historical significance of Jamaican dogwood tree is not only revered for its beauty and ecological significance, Historically, it also holds a place in traditional medicine dating back to the indigenous cultures of the Caribbean. The tree bark was used by indigenous tribes as a sedative or an analgesic. It was also commonly used to stun fish, leading its nickname, the fish poison tree. So they would put the, the tree bark in the waters where they were going to be fishing, because it was a sedative and it would relax the fish and they were able to gather more fish that way. Modern science has validated some of these traditional uses. The bark of the Jamaican dogwood contains a variety of compounds including iflavonones, retinoids, and substances known for their analgesic, sedative, and anti-inflammatory properties. The tree is a fascinating example of the botanical remedies provided by nature. It also helps with heart problems as well and high blood pressure. Uh, it is a wonderful herb. So hopefully everyone here will remember that we are having an herbal class where we'll learn more about the herbs that we're speaking about. In order to be purified and to remain pure, Seventh-day Adventists must have the Holy Spirits in their hearts and in their homes. The Lord has given me light that when the Israel of today humble themselves before him, and cleanse the soul temple from all defilement, he will hear their prayers in behalf of the sick and will bless in the use of his remedies for disease. So he's going to put a special blessing on his remedies when we meet the protocol. Mm. When in faith, the human agent does all he can to combat the disease using the simple methods of treatment that God has provided, his efforts will be blessed of God. Amen. Amen. So I, I thank you for today, and I, I hope that all the herbs that we've been discussing, that you are looking them up. Are you researching them? to See what they do so you'll know about them? Knowledge is power. Amen. Happy Sabbath. Can you hear me okay? Good. So it's 20 to 12, just letting you know my starting time. Uh, would you like to have more confidence as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian? Oh, praise the Lord. I'm, 
prayerful that the message today will do that. Most of us are familiar with the term the great controversy, right? Uh, the great controversy between Christ and Satan. And it has been in play really since the fall of mankind. And it's comforting to keep in mind that the Lord always has a plan and a purpose. And you say amen? amen. And so part of that plan that the Lord has uh, includes raising up a church for a specific purpose in these last days of earth's history. Our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, has been in existence for, uh, as an official denomination, for 161 years. And the Bible speaks of this war that Satan has. Um, I have it up on the screen for you, Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of of Jesus Christ. So why would Satan wage war against a church? Because it's his goal, it's his life work, his design and his purpose to battle truth, battle against truth, uh, to battle against the author of truth, and as a result to battle against God's remnant people. So it's, it's a battle over souls for eternity. Not temporarily, but for eternity. Uh, in 1 Timothy 3.15, it says this, But if I tarry long, that thou mayst know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Notice this, which is the church of the living God, the what? The pillar and the ground of truth. So the design and the purpose of God's church in part is to present the truth of God's word. We're, we see here that the church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. When you come in through the doors, you should expect to hear the truth. And so Satan is against that because the truth reveals the character of God. And Satan certainly doesn't want to do that. Um, he wants God's character to be tainted uh, he wants us to believe that God is someone other than he actually is because he's trying to win the great controversy. The Bible says that Satan is the father of lies and therefore he hates the truth. He hates this. He hates the church that is preaching the truth. He's the father of lies, so he wages war against the remnant because, you know, God has entrusted us with... Uh, Truths that need to be shared with a lost and dying world at a specific time. We call it present truth. The Bible calls it present truth. Um, I don't know about you, but I love the prophecies of the Bible. Um, and I love them for many reasons, but one reason in particular is that when you see prophecy being fulfilled, it testifies of how great God is. You know, his omnipotence, his, uh, you know, his all being present, his omnipresence, um, it just testifies of how great he is. And if we let it, prophecy, we study prophecy and we look at the fulfillment of prophecy, it can renew and strengthen our faith. Um, and it can reinforce our belief system. And, and in some cases, perhaps like it had never has been before. So it should bring us great confidence in God's word as well. When you read a prophecy, you see the fulfillment, it should give you great confidence. Um, and that's vital, I believe, uh, today. <clears throat> Ellen White said this, In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance in, uh, to our present standing, I can say, praise God. As I see what God has wrought, I am filled with astonishment. And with confidence in Christ as leader, we have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. So you can see from the spirit of prophecy how important it is to examine what God has done as we move forward. So, you know, it's really imperative that we educate ourselves 
uh, regarding how God has worked in the past. So let's take an Adventist journey. Let's take the Adventist journey. I want to pray first. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we want to thank you for uh, the blessing of getting us through another week uh, of this beautiful Sabbath of a place to worship. And Lord, as we do that, I pray that you would take distractions away, that our hearts and our minds would be open to hear from heaven, and that you would speak through me to your glory. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. In and around um, 1780, there was a simultaneous interdenominational and inter independent um, study of the books of Daniel and Revelation, primarily. And this was taking place uh, without collaboration. In other words, one person did not know that another person um, was studying the same text and drawing similar conclusions. So the Holy Spirit was inspiring different people uh, to study primarily those two books, Daniel and Revelation. Now, keep in mind that in 1780, there were no Seventh-day Adventists. There was no Seventh-day Adventist church. Primarily, uh, the text that they focused on, that the Holy Spirit led them to, is on the screen here, Daniel 8, 14. And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days... Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, that word cleansed, it means to be made right or to be made righteous. So we could read it this way. We could say, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be made right or righteous. So this uh, simultaneous, independent um, Study and understanding was taking place not only here in the United States, and, and as Adventists, we recognize that northern New England uh, was the hub of this, uh, but this was happening all over the world. It was happening in South America, in England, um, in the Middle East, in Europe, in Africa, uh, and other places. Um, for example, in South America, the Holy Spirit actually impressed a Jesuit priest uh, by the name of Manuel de la Cunza. And he was studying uh, the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and he came to the startling conclusion that Jesus was soon to return. And so I, I put the translation of the title of that book up there for you, The Coming of the Messiah in Glory and Majesty, Volume 1. <clears throat> and so he wrote uh, this manuscript initially, um, and in doing that, he feared for his life, and so he used uh, a pen name, a non de plume. And his pen name was Juan Jehoshaphat Benezra when he originally wrote this manuscript. Um, and he did that for his safety. In Britain, there were 700 Anglican priests that, uh, from the Church of England, and they were preaching the same thing that he had discovered and wrote in his manuscript, that Jesus was soon to come, and they had a date of 1843 or 1844. Now, in the Middle East and in Africa, this man, Joseph Wolf, Dr. Wolf, he was discovering and preaching the very same thing. Uh, this man here, John Albright Bengel, uh, he's a germ or was a German Lutheran theologian. He was a biblical scholar. And he was studying, the Holy Spirit was impressing him, uh, he and others. There were others in Germany, in France, in Switzerland, um, many ministers in Scandinavia. They were all recognizing the lateness of the hour as they studied uh, the Bible prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And they believed Jesus was soon to come. And so, with the Lord at the helm, you've got to remember that the Lord was driving the ship through the Holy Spirit, this Advent message was carried to a very large part of the inhabited globe. Very amazing what God was doing. There was no internet, no telephone, etc., etc., right? So you can imagine uh, the power that God was using to reach all of these people. And hopefully you'll, you'll gather as we continue... Uh, how massive this became. 
So um, this was God's plan, and it could not be stopped. Could not be stopped. By 1830, 75 scholars and writers on three continents had arrived at the same interpretation of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, and they predicted the cleansing of the sanctuary as predicted in Daniel 8.14 would take place sometime in the early 1840s. So how did they all arrive at the, these dates? Well, it's very simple. Um, it had been long understood and accepted that the Bible, in prophecy, a day was equal to a year. Ezekiel 4, verse 6, and Numbers 14, 34. One prophetic day was equal to one literal year. And again, the text that was under the microscope was this text in Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days... Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. So the 2,300 days would then be what? 2,300 years, that's right. So all the Bible student needed was a starting point because it's basic math. And so they found the starting point in Daniel chapter 9, in verse 25, where it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem. Now, I put this up on the screen, and I don't know if we could shut these lights off here so they can see the screen a little bit better. Um, you can see the starting point here at 457 B.C., and you can read about that in Ezra chapter 7. Thank you. In Ezra chapter 7, uh, verses 12 through 26. And I'll try to make that a little bit larger for you um, right there. You can see that 2300 year prophecies laid out in great detail uh, in that slide. So what they did is they took that date of 457 and they just simply subtracted 457 from 2300 and they came to the date of 1843. And if you deal with zero year properly, that's where you end up. <clears throat> Now, most of you are familiar with this man, William Miller. Now, William Miller, he grew up in a Christian home. And in adulthood, he abandoned his faith, uh, his beliefs, and he became a deist. In other words, he believed that God created the world and then just abandoned it. Uh, that was his belief for some time. But later, he began a verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible, starting in Genesis. And he did a verse-by-verse -verse study, and, and he said he would not go on to the next verse until he had a complete understanding of the verse he just read. And it took him two years to do that. Now, William Miller arrived at the same date of 1843. He believed and he taught that the climax of that 2300-day prophecy would result in the coming of Jesus. He would come to the earth to cleanse the earth by fire. And eventually, an exact date was fixed in which they taught Jesus would come. So he had this two-year verse-by-verse study of the Bible. And upon the conviction of the Holy Spirit, um, in, in 1818, after the two-year study, he felt the Holy Spirit call him to go and tell the world of their danger. Do you think the preacher should tell uh, the world of, of the dangers that lie ahead? So he felt the Holy Spirit convicting him to do that, but he resisted the call. And he didn't find any relief at all. You know, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, if you're sensitive, um, there's no relief until you do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. Uh, that, I've had that experience. And so uh, he told God in so many words, he said, if I receive an unsolicited invitation, then I'll do it. I'll go tell it to the world. And within 30 minutes, his nephew showed up at his home and asked him to come and preach. And that was the beginning of something great and something new for him. So uh, during his verse-by-verse -verse study of the Bible um, of Daniel, um, he read and recognized the exact fulfillment of the prophecies that we know about in Daniel chapter 2 
in Daniel's, Daniel 7 that deal with the kingdoms, right? And as he did that, his confidence uh, in the Bible and his assurance in his interpretation of uh, the prophecy there in Daniel 8.14 just grew and grew and grew. And looking back on that time, he commented, he said, the period in which we began to publish the news of a coming Savior, I think it the happiest time of my life. The glorious appearing of Christ is my only hope. To this I cling. So, Satan was watching this. You know, he's aware of what's going on in the churches, outside the churches. And he was witnessing an incredible thing happening, right? He was watching what the Holy Spirit was doing in different parts of the world. And, of course, he was concerned about that. He sees this enlightenment happening all over the planet. And so he didn't just sit back and let it happen. He doesn't just sit back. So he used secular and religious publications to print outright lies and exaggerations regarding Miller and others who supported this second advent message. The general convention of Baptists called the second advent teaching a delusion. And in 1846, they remarked that it was the greatest calamity that has befallen us since our organization. I want you to think about that. The second coming of Jesus, you find it in the Gospels. I mean, if you just think of Matthew chapter 24 alone, Jesus was talking about his second advent. But the Baptist church officially said that the, that teaching is the greatest calamity that had befallen them since they became a church. So you can see Satan is working because he's very, very angry about what God is doing. So look to your right or to your left, and if someone is sleeping, just kind of give them a, a gentle nudge. So Miller was referred to by another publication, the Republic, Republican Herald, as a quack pretender. And they referred to Miller and others. They said, these men are the worst enemies of God for, for teaching the Bible. Ellen White, about this, Ellen White said this. She said, we needed great patience, for the scoffers were many. The Orthodox churches used every means to prevent the belief in Christ's soon coming from spreading. No liberty was granted in their meetings to those who dared mention a hope of the second coming of Christ. So remember, these people were all members of churches. There was no Seventh-day Adventist church. So, of course, they wanted to share this great hope, this great uh, things, these things that they had learned. Professed lovers of Jesus scornfully rejected the tidings that he whom they claimed as their best friend was soon to visit them. They were excited and angered against those who proclaimed the news of his coming and who rejoiced that they should speedily behold him in his glory. Now, I, I haven't quite figured out why uh, they would be angered against the proclamation of the second coming of Jesus unless they weren't ready. And perhaps that was it. But we know that Satan was the one that was working. Miller became a full-time preacher of the second advent, and he traveled a great deal um, trying to meet the countless requests for him to come and share because Miller had charts, and the charts would help. Like, we like to have PowerPoints, and we put things up there. It helps us to understand what's happening. Well, he had, he had these charts, and he would go through the prophecies, and it just, ooh, the Holy Spirit was working. And so he got these requests, one after the other, and so he traveled all the time. He wanted to share uh, the best he could, and many camp meetings were held. And I believe the first camp meeting was in my old uh, stomping ground in Exeter, New Hampshire, um, and they had a tent there for their tent meetings, and that tent was 55 feet tall, and it held about 4,000 people. Now, this tent 
this is a picture from 1930. This is not the tent, because I tell you the tent was larger than this one. This tent is not 55 feet high, and it doesn't hold 4,000. There's probably 3,000 people there. Um, it was a massive tent, and it was possibly the largest, it was the largest tent in the United States, and possibly in all the world. It was huge. And there were 125 or so of these tent meetings that took place just in the Northeast. And there were so many people that wanted to go to these tent meetings that they had to set up a special rail service to train these people, to get them on trains and take them to these uh, tent meetings that were being held. Just amazing how the Holy Spirit was working. So the date that uh, William Miller was sharing was biblical. It was biblical. It was based on the type found in the Bible, the cleansing of the earthly sanctuary, on what we call the Day of Atonement, or the Bible calls the Day of Atonement. And it happened each year on the 10th day of the seventh month. Or on our calendar in 1844, it was what? October what? 22nd. That was the day of antitypical or the Day of Atonement back in 1844. Do you know what date this year is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement in the Jewish calendar? Today, that's right. October 12th, 2024. It's always, though, the 10th day of the seventh month. Ellen White said, Our calculation of the prophetic time was so simple and plain that even children could understand it. That's why we encourage children to uh, listen closely. In every part of the land, light was given concerning this message, and the cry aroused thousands. It went from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country regions. It reached the learned and the talented, as well as the obscure and humble. And she said this, this was the happiest year of my life. Happiest year of her life. The, pl the promise is plain that special blessing will accompany the studying of these prophecies. The Bible says this. It says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. That's a promise. That's an encouragement, I hope. The Bible says this, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So in Daniel's day of enlightenment, right? God used Daniel as a prophet, dreams and visions and the interpretation of those uh, things that he received from God. Really, nearly the whole of the book of Daniel was prophetic. And he was told to shut up or seal the book until the last days. It really was God saying, I'm going to seal your book. I'm going to shut it up and seal it until the last days. When, through the power and guidance of the Holy Spirit, when the time was exactly right, just as God has planned, men would run to and fro through the scriptures, through the scrolls. And knowledge of those books would be increased. Now, it does have a dual application, but I don't want us to get lost in technology, although that has increased, and the, the, the ability to travel. Um, but primarily, this is talking about men running to and fro through the scriptures and knowledge of those prophecies increasing. So I want to uh, uh, have you go to Daniel, I mean Revelation chapter 10. And as you do that, um, I'll just share, you know, they would search the scriptures. Knowledge would increase. This is during this Advent awakening. And things would be made clear to their understanding. That's exactly what happened 
in the early 1790s. So now if you're in Revelation chapter 10, look at verse 1. I'm going to move quickly through this. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. So here we have a messenger from heaven, an angel that's different and distinct from all the other angels mentioned. And it's clear from verse 1 that the messenger is Jesus himself. He's clothed with a cloud, a rainbow on his head, indicating the grace and mercy, the love of Jesus. His face is like the sun. The Bible tells us the lamb is the light. His feet like pillars of fire. Now look at verse 2. And he had in his hand a little book opened, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. So reference is being made to the little book of Daniel, which is almost entirely prophetic. It was sealed and shut up. And notice that the messenger has his feet on the sea and the land, which tells us that the message, the message is found, must go to the entire world because the earth and the sea encompasses all the populated parts of the world. It's got to go to the entire world and that perfectly fits with the message that we're, we're to be sharing, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14, where it says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So it has to go to the whole world. And the message, it says uh, that the everlasting gospel is to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So it has to go to everyone. The everlasting gospel, the judgment, the cleansing of the sanctuary. And then it talks about true worship on the day that God set aside. Now if you look at verse 7, same chapter, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So the mystery of God, we're told, would be finished. In other words, the gospel, that's the mystery of God, would be pre pre presented to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Now, we'll pick it up in verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Verse 10, And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was what? bitter. And he said unto me, thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So the little book are those things declared by Christ through the Holy Spirit to the prophets, specifically Daniel, to be understood at a specific time. So John is told, go and take the book it's open in the hand of Christ. Eat it up. In other words, digest it. Comprehend it fully. John represents those that proclaimed the advent of Jesus in the late 1790s, early 1840s. All the way up through 1840 and onward. So he tells his end time messengers... Um, that as you come to understand the once sealed prophecies of this little book, it's going to be a sweet experience. Wow, the, all of everything's fitting together, these prophecies and the dates and the fulfillment, Jesus is soon to come. I mean, there's not a, a greater uh, thing that we could experience. That was their experience. They believed at a heart level that Jesus was soon to come. They were convinced of it. It was a sweet experience experience. But once it was fully realized and Jesus didn't come, it was a bitter disappointment. 
So uh, verse 6 of chapter 10 announces the end of the 23 uh, hundred year prophecy. It says, And swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. In other words, no more time prophecies after the 2300 days, 2300 years. So on October 22nd, 1844, a group of Adventists, as they were called, they were from many different denominations. They stood at a place in Lowhampton, New York. Has anybody been there? A few of us have been there. From early morning until after midnight, they waited in joyful expectation for the coming of their Savior. That was that sweet experience. They were waiting. These people weren't alone. Uh, there was between 100,000 and estimates of up to a million people around the world. They estimated one in every 17 Americans was an Adventist, scattered all over the place, and thousands of people abroad. They we waited eagerly in anticipation of the second coming, Jesus coming. Young and old, they were looking up, waiting for Jesus to come in the clouds. I don't know if you've stepped outside uh, at night uh, lately, but where we live, praise the Lord, there's no light pollution at all. It has been so clear. And you step out and you look up and you can just see. And it's just amazing. These people were looking up, waiting to see Jesus descend from the clouds to take them home. Many believers, uh, they sold or gave away their possessions. Many left crops in the ground to rot in the fields. And Miller also you know, he was waiting in quiet anticipation of the end. Newspaper headline, I put it up on the screen for you. This is what the newspaper said. End of the world, October 22nd, 1844. It wasn't a secret. Everybody was talking about it. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And they did. And midnight came and went, and so did their hopes. For many of them, their hopes just were dashed. Jesus didn't come back. And as a result... There was a great disappointment. It fell upon God's people, and it quickly resulted in a great shaking among the Advent believers. So that number, they estimate as high as a million people, was, re was reduced to 50 people, approximately 50 people. So if we took the conservative number of 100,000 Adventists, after the great disappointment, there were 50 core believers whose faith was real. And God needed to do that. That experience had to happen so he could purify a church. It, the, the church has to start pure. You understand that, right? I don't need really to explain that. That's what God was doing. But those that were sincere in their faith and trust in the Savior... Yes, they wept bitterly, but they did not give up hope. Amen. Instead, they, they more earnestly prayed and more earnestly studied God's word. They realized the mistake has to be with our interpretation because all of these prophecies have been fulfilled 100%. Something's wrong here, and it's got to be with us. This much diminished number of people got together. They prayed. They knew that something was missing. They experienced this great disappointment. And this was their experience. It was bitter in their belly. And John prophesies about that. Ellen White said it was a bitter disappointment that fell upon the little flock whose faith had been so strong and whose hope had been so high. But we were surprised that we felt so free in the Lord and were so strongly sustained by his strength and grace. So God was with them. During this time, a large class renounced their faith. That's an understatement. Some who had been very confident were so deeply wounded in their pride that they felt like fleeing from the world. Like Jonah, they complained of God and chose death rather than life. Those who had built their faith upon the evidence of others and not upon the word of God were now as ready to again change their views. So, there's something there I, want you, I don't want you to miss at the end of that. We should not build our faith upon the evidence of others. 
You need to know why you believe the things that you believe. And, and we try to instill that in our children, I hope, right? I know Michelle and I did. We want you to understand why you believe the things that you believe. Be able to point to them in Scripture. She said, we were disappointed, but not disheartened. We resolved to refrain from murmuring at the trying ordeal by which the Lord was what? Purging us from the dross and refining us like gold in the furnace to submit patiently to the process of purifying that God deemed needful for us. See, God knows the heart. He said, I have, to do, I have to allow this to happen to purify and to wait with patient hope for the Savior to redeem his tried and faithful ones. In reviewing our past history, having traveled over every step of advance to our present standing, I can say, what did she say? Praise God as I see what God has wrought. I am filled with astonishment and with confidence in Christ as leader. We have nothing to fear for the future except as we forget the way the Lord has led us and his teaching in our past history. I am baffled by how people can become Adventists. Seventh-day Adventists, study, learn, embrace, be overjoyed by the truths of Scripture and then leave and become a Baptist or a Pentecostal or whatever. I knew a pastor. He taught for decades in the church. He's now a Baptist pastor. It baffles me. But here's one of the reasons. They forget the way the Lord has led us in his teachings in our past history. If you think of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, what did the Babylonians do immediately when they came into their realm? That's right, they gave them Babylonian names, they changed their language, their everything. They wanted their history to be erased. And if we forget our history, it will be much easier for us to go out. That's right. Sons and daughters of God, page 259, the end is near, she said. We have not a moment to lose. Light is to shine forth from God's people in clear distinct rays. No, you know, beating around the bush, bringing Jesus before the churches and before the world. As Christ's ambassadors, that's us, they are to search the scriptures to seek for the truths that have been hidden beneath the rubbish of error. And let me tell you, there's a lot of error in the church, a lot of rubbish out there. There are splinter groups and other groups that go off on these tangents, and they try to get you and I to fall trapped to that. But what are we to do? Search the scriptures, seek for the truth. Seek for the truth. She goes on, and every ray of light received is to be communicated to others. One interest will prevail, one subject will swallow up every other Christ our righteousness. Can you say amen to that? Amen. So let's summarize what took place. There was an independent, interdenominational, and systematic study of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, specifically focused on Daniel 8.14. Ultimately, a date was fixed, October 22nd, 1844. And the date was, in fact, correct. The event was not, as we know. Jesus didn't come. The cleansing of the sanctuary did not mean that the earth was going to be cleansed by fire at the second coming. And so as a result of the event being wrong, the Adventist believers suffered a great disappointment. The Lord purged the church. He used that disappointment to test the hearts of the people. A kind of a winnowing, a shaking took place that left that very small group. But within 19 years of the great disappointment, God, using many of his tried and faithful group, he formed the Seventh-day Adventist Church, became an official organization in 1863. And that small group has grown to between 20 and 25 million people today, worldwide. So what can we learn? We can learn a lot of things from the experience of these pioneers of the Remnant Church. And Amos 3.7 tells us, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets 
to his servants, the prophets. See, God's word and prophecies, they are a demonstration of the love of God. He is revealing these things to us um, for hope, for warning, for wisdom, for reformation, for our salvation. Right? And we should look at those prophecies and say, wow, the Lord Jesus, he loves us. So when led by the Holy Spirit, God's people can accomplish great things. We saw that. That message, it went to the whole world. So this awakening in early 1840s, it swept the world. It infiltrated cities and little towns, and they were preaching in barns and in kitchens and in living rooms, and it spread like wild. Why? Because the Holy Spirit was behind it, and God's people believed the truth. They believed the prophecies. They loved it, and they embraced it. They had a love for Jesus in their hearts, and it allowed them to love others, to love the lost. And the thought of Jesus coming soon it has the ability within the message to stir the heart. I hope that your heart is stirred when you think of the soon coming of Jesus. It can awaken the sleeping Christians, and there are some sleeping Christians right now in this room. It can awaken them and make them zealous and make them committed. The signs of the times denote that the end of all things is at hand. So we have to watch and hold ourselves in readiness for the coming of the Master at any time. We must wait with hope and trust, not neglecting the assembling of ourselves together for instruction, for encouragement and comfort, that our light might shine forth in a dark world. So the Adventists of the day, they recognized the time in which they lived, and they lived as sojourners. So the Adventist church was a movement. And in many parts of the world, it's still a movement. And when the church was first formed, it didn't take long. And the other denominations and the leaders were afraid of the Seventh-day Adventists. They were afraid of us, not because we were violent. To the contrary, because we had tents and we moved about and we preached a message right from Scripture and thousands of people accepted it. But they're not afraid of us anymore. Because we have church buildings like everybody else. We're inwardly focused in many places. We're not outwardly focused. We're not a movement like we should be. But they were. They were involved in a movement. They were sojourners. They knew their time on this earth was brief. That their citizenship was in heaven. And they needed to be unselfish and get out there and share the message. Hiram Edson. You've heard that name before, right? He's perhaps the best, uh, he's probably best known for um, his role in uncovering why Jesus didn't come. There's a picture of him. Now, he looks very stern, but, you know, he wasn't an angry man. And I think photography, as we know very well, wasn't that great back then. And you look at these pictures, sometimes you'll see a picture of Ellen White, you'll be like, well, she looks mean. But it's just the way the photographs are. These were loving, kind, caring people. You know, Ellen White used to hand out cookies to the children. You know, um, and that might surprise you, but she did. You know, she loved the children. She loved people. And Hiram Edson, um, he, he was um, really, an, the Lord used him in an important way. And throughout the rest of his life, he encouraged and he guided others to the truths of the Bible. So how did he help unravel the great disappointment? Well, on October 23, 1844, the next day, while people were reeling in disappointment, Edson, um, a Millerite leader in the area, got a distinct impression that he needed to encourage the brethren. And so these guys got together, Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Courgier, I'll put a picture of him up there. Uh, they got together and they prayed. They said, you know, the mistake must be ours. Lord, help us to understand what is going on. And after their long prayer, they set off through a cornfield to visit neighbors because the Holy Spirit impressed Edson that he needed to encourage people, encourage the brethren. They're, they're downhearted right now. And so they're walking to the cornfield and Edson stopped. And Kosher kept walking. And when he turned around and realized that he was 
stopped in his tracks. He said, Brother Edson, why, why are you stopping? And Edson responded, the Lord was answering our morning prayer. And he shared how the Holy Spirit impressed him that Jesus wasn't supposed to come to the earth on October 22nd. Rather, Jesus had begun an important work in the investigative judgment in the heavenly sanctuary that Jesus had gone from the holy place to the most holy place. The antitypical Day of Atonement. And so this impression spurred Edson along with Kosher and other individual, another individual uh, named F.B. Hahn. We don't do that so much, you know. B.P. Milano. We don't do that. We don't put the initials. A lot of people don't. But they did. It seemed like everybody was, you know, dealing with these initials. But F.B. Hahn and Edson and Kosher, they got together, they studied the Bible, and the Lord opened to them Hebrews chapter 8 and 9. And they recognized, ah, the earthly sanctuary is the type. And we're seeing that Jesus is our high priest and he's ministering on our behalf. He's, he's applying his blood to our record. He's blotting out the record of sin. He went from the holy place to the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary. Heavenly sanctuary was the temple to be cleansed, not the earth. So the little remnant studied, prayed, and they examined closely what the Old Testament taught. They connected the prophetic dots uh, and they recognized what really happened. What was the event uh, on October 22nd? Jesus stepped into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary where the Ark of the Covenant is, which contains the transcript of God's care, character, the Ten Commandments written with God's own finger. It's a powerful truth. And it brought God's people to their knees just like it did the faithful Israel on the Day of Atonement. Because on the Day of Atonement, in Israel, they were to afflict their souls or be cut off from amongst God's people. You know, God's people today, they lack power because they lack purpose. You know, when I was um, in North Carolina this week, I could tell you every one of those people, all the volunteers, they had a purpose. So we stayed on the floor in an Adventist church in Asheville, and then we would travel um, to uh, the different areas of devastation. And while we were gone, the ladies were taking donations that were coming in by the truckload. They were organizing them, filling boxes. And the last day that I was there, 900 people came to the church and received provisions. And it was a handful of women doing this. They had a purpose, and nothing could stop them. They're on their feet for 12 hours, lifting heavy boxes and handing them out. And, and so God's people today need a purpose. It's the Adventist movement. We're supposed to be raising up churches everywhere. So we need to recognize the lateness of the hour. You know, whether Jesus comes in a few months or a few years, we need to embrace the fact that we are living in the judgment hour, and that is the message that needs to go in part to the world. Christ is coming soon. It seems like he's tarrying. But he's not. For the vision is yet for an appointed time. Now this, this text meant a lot to uh, the pioneers after the disappointment. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. In other words, the prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Jesus is going to come. We need to be ready. So are you ready? Are you living your Christian life as though time is going to go on forever? And that there will always be another chance to get ready. Or are you going day by day, uh, recognizing that you are living in a time just before Jesus comes, prophecies are being fulfilled all the time. Or are you like the pioneers, living in joyful hope of the return of Jesus? I hope you are. So the Bible's clear. We are to be um, living in the antitypical day of atonement. In other words, we're, we're to be doing what the Israelites of old were to do, searching our hearts 
with the guidance and the conviction of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to make sure there is nothing in our lives that separates us from God. Absolutely certain that Jesus is our trusted Savior. See, He's made Himself available to be Savior for everyone, but the Bible is clear. The majority of people will not take Jesus as their Savior. And we've talked about this before. We need to cooperate with our high priest in the work that he's doing. That requires soul searching, searching of hearts, humbling ourselves. We want to be absolutely certain that Christ is our righteousness, that his merit, his sacrifice, his high priestly work is ours. So will you allow Jesus to be your advocate? You got to open everything up to him. You know, there's no, nothing hidden from him anyway. You know, um, we have to open everything to him. We allow the Holy Spirit to bring you to your knees. You know, I, I believe that one of the things that Satan does the most, he and his demons, is to tell you you don't need to pray. To whisper, oh, you don't really need to pray. You prayed earlier. Don't worry about it. We need to pray. I want to invite you to stand um, if that's your desire. If you're able to stand, if that's your desire. And I'm going to kneel and I want us to pray together. Let's bow our heads. Loving Father, we want to thank you for your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, um, your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of your word and the depth of your word. Uh, we appreciate and love the spirit of prophecy, which, which really uh, pulls everything together in such a remarkable way. Thank you, Lord, that um, your servant John was able to lay out uh, the history of the Adventist church through uh, the impressions of the Holy Spirit and through Christ's words so that we could recognize um, who we are as a people and our mission on this earth. Lord, help us to surrender all to you, to open our hearts uh, to you, to not leave anything uh, between you and us. Lord, we need an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We need to be right with you. We need to have our purpose restored uh, to remember where we came from and to move forward in faith. We're going to see great things happen. We just need to continue to trust in you completely. We thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer and answering it. In Jesus' name, amen. Lucy.